serve him as his precious child.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our risen and ascended Lord, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, fellow children of God. Think for a moment, and could you think of the most popular baby names for the 2020s so far? I'll give you just a second or two to think about it. Well, according to at least one website, the most popular girls' names in the 2020s so far are Olivia, Emma, and Charlotte. And for the boys, the top three names are Liam, Noah, and Oliver. How close for you? Uh, got one? Yeah, good. Uh, it's sort of interesting to see how names come in and out of favor. At least for me, a lot of those names seem sort of old-fashioned. But at the same time, they've been discovered by a, a younger generation. Uh, why do parents name their kids the names that they do? A lot of times, well, maybe it has to do something with family, grandma, aunt, something like that. A lot of times it's just because, well, I like that name. It, it sounds nice. Or, or maybe there's another case where, well, that name brings a certain memory to my mind. And a lot of times, names can just come out of the air. And for that matter, in the Bible, a lot of times it was that same way too. We hear a lot of the names in the Bible, and, and a lot of them aren't all that familiar to us, but they would have been pretty familiar back then. But then there are other times when those names really mean something. Uh, for example, Abraham. That's the name that God gave to Abram, and, and that means a father of nations, or many nations. Uh, or Benjamin, a, a name that was given by Jacob to one of his sons. The son of my right hand. It was one of his sons that he dearly loved. Or, or think of Peter. That's the name that Jesus gave to Simon. And that name Peter means rock. And it spoke a little bit about Peter's confession and Peter's place coming ahead in the future. And so, yeah, sometimes even then, there would be names given for a specific reason because God knew what was in store. But like I mentioned before, yeah, there were also other times when names were just names, just a way to tell people apart. But that's entirely different when it comes to the name of our Lord. The name Jesus Christ is one that was picked long before Jesus was born. We could even say from eternity. And there's a reason for it. The name Christ is the same as the Old Testament word Messiah. And both those names mean the anointed one. The one who has been set apart. Those names remind us that Jesus came according to God's plan and purpose just as he had promised to accomplish God's will. And then there's the name Jesus. The name Jesus is, is connected to the Old Testament name Joshua. And both of those mean Savior or the Lord saves. And once again, that speaks to who Jesus is. It speaks to the whole purpose for which he came into this world. As the angel explained to Joseph concerning Mary before they, they fully officially became husband and wife, the angel said, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That name Jesus is in that word, word save. And as we look at our lesson for this morning, we see that the name of Jesus Christ is powerful. It's not powerful like a magic word, like abracadabra or something like that, but it's powerful because that's the name that God chose to reveal himself to us, to reveal our Savior to us. And so as we look at our lesson, we see that the name of Jesus is powerful to heal, but also that the name of Jesus is powerful to save. Uh, sometime after the day of Pentecost, we read in Acts chapter 3, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. 
Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. but What I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. This is the word of our Lord. Now, as I mentioned, this happened sometime after Pentecost. We're not exactly sure how long after Pentecost. Uh, But one thing that we get from that is that even after Jesus completed the work of salvation, that message about who he is and what he had come to accomplish continued to go out. And just like it was during Jesus' ministry, yes, that, that message continued to go out, but at the same time, it also met with resistance. It also met with opposition. Uh, If you keep reading in Acts chapters 3 and 4, you'll hear about how what happened in our account led Peter and John to end up in prison. And then after that, they they were scolded not to do that again. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, we read, Then the Sanhedrin called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They didn't want to hear about it anymore. They wanted to silence that name. And if you keep reading in the book of Acts, it didn't take very long before a great persecution of Christ's followers broke out in Jerusalem. And so just as that message went out during Jesus' ministry, it continued to go out after Jesus completed the work of salvation. And yeah, still faced that same opposition. But... For the disciples, for those who had heard and learned from Jesus, they couldn't help themselves. They had to continue to teach and and proclaim all the wonderful things Christ had done and Christ had promised. And and so that's what Peter and John are doing. They're they're in Jerusalem. And, And one day we hear about the fact that Peter and John were going to the temple. And it's interesting to note that Jesus didn't come to replace everything. He still went to the temple to worship God. He simply came as a fulfillment of God's promises. And as Jesus, or excuse me, as Peter and John came up to the temple gates, there was this there was this man, right? And he was there every day. And because he was there every day, and because Peter and John were in the habit of going to worship God at his temple, odds are very good, very likely that they had run into this man before. They had seen him there before. They had probably even maybe given him some change or given him some food to eat on on previous days. But this day was different. And that sort of might lead to a question, well, why? Why was this day different? Why, if they had seen him before, why was it this day that he was going to be healed? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that the miracles that were performed in the name of Jesus Christ were were never to entertain the crowds. They were never just to put on a show. Uh, Even in our gospel lesson, we read about that. When, When Jesus met that man who was deaf and mute, he took him away from the crowd, right? It wasn't to put on a show. And God didn't tell his disciples to perform miracles just on a whim. But when Peter and John saw this man on this day, something happened according to God's promise and God's will. It was for God's plan and God's purpose. And part of that purpose is so that we could read about it today and be amazed one more time at what Jesus is able to do. And so Peter stops. He gets the man's full attention. Hey, look at us. He wants him to pay attention to what's going on. And here again, if it was just a popularity contest, Peter could have maybe tried to claim some credit for himself. But Peter knew it wasn't 
about him. And so instead, he pointed to where this man needed to look. He pointed to the strength and source of the power. And as we read, it says, Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And by God's grace, everything changed for that man on that day. God's power was displayed. And notice in in our lesson, there's that word immediately. And that's a big deal. Uh, If you've ever had surgery, maybe it takes a day or two, or a week, or months to recover. Our human bodies are just like that. They take time. But this man didn't just have surgery, but he had been crippled from the time that he was born. And in chapter 4, we're told, for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. He had never learned to walk before. He had spent decades begging from people. But in the name of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden he was healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, he didn't need to build up those muscles and go through therapy. In the name of Jesus Christ, he didn't need to learn how to take, to take a class on, on how to walk. Instead, all at once... This man leaped up. He followed the disciples. He was praising God. His life had changed. And he realized it right away. He realized that that he could give praise to God because he wouldn't have to sit and beg anymore. Now he could gain livelihood. He, He could do some work and earn his food. And what joy he had. He couldn't help himself. You can sort of imagine it there. The disciples are continue walking on. There's this guy bouncing around all over him, just saying, look at the great thing, the wonderful thing, the miraculous thing my God has done for me. Christ shows his power. Christ showed that the, his name is powerful. But then again, that might lead us to the question, well, if Christ accomplished that miracle... Why doesn't that happen all the time? Why don't we see the same types of miracles today as Peter and John witnessed on that day? Or for that matter, why doesn't God make that change in my life so all my problems, all my worries, all my cares are laid aside? Well, notice that like all the other miracles recorded in the Bible, this miracle accomplished God's purpose. It pointed to the fact that Jesus truly is who he claimed to be. That he truly is the eternal son of God who left his throne in heaven in order to be our savior. As Jesus also said when he performed another miracle with a man who had been born blind, he told his disciples, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. All these miracles point to the fact that God is who he claims to be. He's the all-powerful God and Jesus Christ is the eternal, all-powerful God who came into this world to be our Savior. And so that's not the lesson that we learn from this miracle that, well, if we follow Jesus, if we look to him, all of a sudden all of our troubles and our pains will be gone because God never promised that. Instead, what God has promised is that even though we face trials and troubles in this life, all of them can accomplish his purpose. And even when we're facing temptation and and sin and difficulties, we can put our trust that God's promise is still true. Namely that, as we read in Romans, in all things God works for the good of those who love and who have been called according to his purpose. Our Lord remembers or causes us to remember that he is our strength and our comfort. But just like this man could rejoice on that day because his life had changed, we can rejoice because God has given us something even more incredible 
than the healing that he provided through Peter and John. Because you see, the fact that that man was sitting and begging each day at the temple, that wasn't his worst problem in his life. Instead, just like everyone else, that man was a sinner who could not earn a place in God's kingdom. And that, that's what unites us with him. Everyone in this world has fallen short of God's standards. Everyone in this world cannot live up to what God wants us to be because as long as we're in this world, we are sinners. And we face temptation each and every day. And all too often our old sinful nature shows its ugly head. And this problem with sin isn't just a handicap. It isn't something that we can maybe overcome if we try hard enough. It's much more serious than that. This problem with sin separates us from our God. That's why we read in Ephesians, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And there was absolutely nothing that we could do on our own to change our own situation. Even if we had wanted to follow God's will, we were dead in sin. We couldn't do it any more than this man could decide, Well, I want to walk. We were helpless to help ourselves. But still, our Lord had compassion. Jesus, the eternal God, left his throne in heaven so that he could come into this world and walk among us. And as he walked in this world, he walked in righteousness. Now, he faced the same troubles that we do. He, he understood what it was like to lose someone who was close to him. He was... He was experienced in what meant to be rejected. He, he understood what it was like to be bruised and beaten and spit upon. He even knew what it was like to face temptation because the devil was right there every step of the way because he knew if he could trap Jesus off, then our hope would be lost. But still through it all, he kept himself perfect. He knows what it's like to go through temptation, as we also read in the book of Hebrews, because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to face, to help those who are being tempted. But even in the face of temptation, Jesus was pure. And then Jesus was able to do that other thing. Out of his love for us, the Son of God, who walked in righteousness, also walked all the way to the cross so that he could make a sacrifice like none other. As the perfect Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus shed his own blood so that all the times that we've fallen short could be taken away. He shed his blood so our guilt could be buried in his tomb. And then after he made that price, after he offered that sacrifice, Jesus performed another miracle which testified to his power and authority as the Son of God. Jesus left that empty tomb behind to reassure us that we can have a new life in his kingdom. Jesus left that empty tomb behind to prove that he had always been just who he claimed to be, the eternal Son of God. Jesus left that empty tomb behind to heal us from our spiritual helplessness. He brought us from life to death. Paul explains this in his letter to the Romans. He writes, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Just like that man who was seen outside of the temple gates, everything has changed for us. We have a new life in God's kingdom. This changes everything. Now we are God's people. Now we are saints, holy ones, who have been cleansed in the blood of Christ. And yeah, as long as we're living in this world, we're still going to face troubles and trials. And yeah, as long as we're living in this world, we'll full face temptations. But now God has given us the power to say no to temptation. 
And, and even when we do stumble and fall into sin, we can come back before our Lord and receive the forgiveness that he has won for us. Every day, we can be renewed to live as God's people. And this gives us a reason to rejoice. Once again, think what happened with that man after he had seen what God had done for him. He followed the disciples. He went to the temple. He was praising God. Everyone, look, look what God has done for me. And because God has done that for us, because he has given us a new life, because he has changed everything, because, because he has taken away our sin and made us his children, we can, we can sing God's praise too. We can tell those around us, look at the wonderful thing God has done for me. And look at the wonderful thing God has done for you too. What's in the name? Sometimes it's just telling people apart. That's how we use names pretty much today. But with Jesus, it's different. The name of Jesus Christ is powerful. As we saw in our lesson, it's powerful to heal. But as we also realize, it's powerful to save. It gives us a new life so that we can live as God's people. May the name of Jesus Christ be praised forever. Amen. Now may this grace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You are welcome to join us at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, just across the street from the post office in Taylor, Arizona. On Sunday mornings, our Bible study begins at 8.30 and worship begins at 9.30.